Welcome to the Vineyard Church Message of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message. For more information on this podcast or other resources, go to vineyardlive.us. To learn more about us, go to the vineyardchurch.us. Well, if there's one thing that is on everyone's mind right now, it is the coronavirus. In the course of just a few months, we have gone from a uh, mysterious situation of something that looked like pneumonia in China into a global epidemic that we are feeling the massive effects of even right here in central Illinois. It has disrupted our normal routines. We've had runs on grocery stores. We've had canceled classes at universities and more. Um, This is a big adjustment for all of us. And of course, for us as a church family, we have decided to begin to meet together in a different way, (laughs) using the technology of the internet more purposefully. If you're like me, this feels really unprecedented, doesn't it? Uh, Everyone I talk to says we've never, no, none of us have ever experienced anything like this. And it prompts a whole lot of questions. What on earth is happening right now? Uh, What can I expect for the future? Do I need to be worried for myself? Do I need to be worried for my family? And on top of that, what does a response of faith look like in this time? How do I respond as a believer in Jesus? How do we respond as a church? We are in the middle of a massive societal disruption right now. And it's going to be a bit of a stretch. We're going to have to figure a lot of things out together. What I want to do today is I want to talk about what does it mean for us to be the people of faith? What does it mean to be the church in the midst of the time when uh, the coronavirus is disrupting our society? What does it mean for us to be what I'll call the Corona Church? Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. I thank you that you are so big, you are so king, you are incredible, and you have not lost charge of the world in the midst of the chaos that it feels like is all around us. We love you, Jesus. And right now, we just invite you into each and every place, God, that we are uh, experiencing this, that we are gathering together as a church, even uh, virtually and digitally, God. Would you come, would your presence come, God, into the very place that we are right now? And God, we look to you and we ask for your ministry to us today. Lord, would you minister to us that you would put us in a place of strength that we can now begin to minister to the society that is in so much turbulence around us. We love you, Jesus. We ask that you would speak to us now. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to start today by taking some time and talking about where are we and what is going on. I think one of the things that's challenging about our current situation is it is developing so quickly and there are so many unprecedented things happening that it's difficult to understand what is reality and how should I think about it? (laughs) What should I expect? And of course, what the enemy does is anything that we don't understand, he is more than happy to fill in the blanks with his lies and with his fear and all of this. So I want to take some time and I want to talk about what is the reality we find ourselves in. And then once we're clear on that, we'll talk about what does the response of faith look like. So let's, let's review the timeline uh, of how we got here. The, the, the initial uh, story for the coronavirus begins at the very end of last year, December 31st, 2019, in a uh, city called Wuhan in China. China reports some cases of a very strange-looking pneumonia to the WHO, the World Health Organization. In the next week, they find that this this, uh, pneumonia, as they understand it at the time, begins to rapidly spread, and they begin to do all kinds of testing. They quickly learn a few things. Number one, this is not a reoccurrence of SARS and that whole scare that happened uh, a while back. And number two, that this is a new virus that is in the coronavirus family, which incidentally um, includes SARS and the common cold, believe it or not. 
And so um, this is a new strain of uh, the coronavirus family, and the disease that it provokes is now what you're commonly hearing in the media, COVID-19. Um, through January, what happens is uh, cases begin to spread, mostly in China and mostly in Asia, specifically at first. Um, there's a couple of key things that influence the way that this happens. Number one, this is a new virus that there's not, you know, like general immunity to. And anytime there's a new virus, it means that it, it, it replicates much more quickly because, you know, if you take a flu or a cold or the kind of seasonal things that we tend to experience, um, we have degrees of immunity that we have from the last time we got the cold or whatever. Um, in this instance, it's a new virus. Nobody has that degree of immunity, and so everyone can become a carrier. And so it begins to grow and spread very quickly. Now, this is of particular concern in the instance uh, in China at the time that it happened because for a few reasons. Number one, it's important we understand these things. Um, if not, it's easy to kind of interpret things and jump into panic. So there's a few things happening here. Number one, the population density in China is so high that the disease spreads extremely quickly. Wuhan is a city of 11 million people. That's the size of New York City. You don't get higher population densities in most of the world than where this thing begins. And so it replicates very quickly because of high population density. And on top of that, this is all happening right before the Lunar New Year, which was January 25th um, this year. The reason that matters is in China, the Lunar New Year is kind of like Thanksgiving or Christmas is here. It's the time of year where everybody stops their job, travels home, wherever home is, and, uh, and gathers and eats and celebrates together with their family. This is the worst possible thing that can happen when you are trying to contain a new virus. You have a country of 1.4 billion people, and you're going to shuffle all of them all throughout the entire country. This is the way that things begin to explode and become really problematic. And so the, the people in China realize this, and they start taking drastic measures to try to contain the situation so that we don't have a massive percentage of the entirety of China getting infected over the course of a week. And so they take some drastic measures. They do things like shut down uh, a number of cities, including that original city of Wuhan. By the way, this is just a little personal note. Um, but when I lived in China, when we were young, I actually remember going to that city. Uh, we lived about four hours away. It was the nearest major city. And so uh, we would travel there sometimes. We had friends that lived there. And that is making this whole thing kind of bizarre for me. <laughs> Anyway, China um, throughout January is working to try to contain um, the situation. And by January 30th, the World Health Organization says, guys, this is a global emergency. We head into February, and um, what happens is the population density of China allows the disease to continue to spread. Um, it's, it's not too long before we rapidly have tens of thousands of confirmed uh, infections. And people begin to study um, the infections and the deaths and to try to understand uh, the nature of the disease, who's at risk, et cetera. And we're going to look at that in a little bit. Cases uh, throughout February begin to spread throughout other countries more rapidly. Um, and uh, this is the nature of living in the 21st century. Particularly Iran, South Korea, and Italy are heavily hit as we come uh, through February as they're wrestling with this and trying to find the appropriate measures to take to slow the spread of the illness, etc. Um, by the end of February, there's something really encouraging that starts happening in China. The uh, it, growing new cases of reported infections uh, begin to dwindle. They actually begin to massively decrease um, to the point where we had at the beginning of, uh, of the outbreak, when we're in, um, in January and uh, you know, some of the early February, we had hundreds, maybe thousands of new cases um, that were being confirmed every single day that number begins to dwindle significantly in China as we are heading into February. And by the end of February, we're in hundreds, and uh, as we come into March, we're dropping into less than that. In fact, March 12th, this past week, China reported only 15 new cases. 
This is a really important uh, thing for us to understand because um, diseases have kind of a rate at which they spread throughout a society. And the length of that duration is a really important thing to know. And so we realize that this is something that spreads rapidly, but it also kind of comes over the hump rather rapidly too. Um, and so that's a really good thing to know. By the time we come into March, um, coronavirus is continuing to spread throughout the world and a whole lot of countries are wrestling with the exponential spread of the disease that happens at the beginning of any infection that people do not have uh, immunity to. By March 11th, the WHO declares the coronavirus a global pandemic. And by the time we come into this last week, we are beginning to feel heavily the influence and the impact of this in our local communities as we've had runs on store supplies, we've had canceled events, uh, we've had schools being adjusted, and a whole lot of tension and fear in society. Okay, so this is the history, this is the development of what has been happening over the last few months. What have we learned in that process and how can we expect our experience moving forward to be? Well, fortunately, there have been a whole lot of people working very hard to understand our situation and we have learned some really important things, okay? Here's a few things that we have learned. Um, while no new virus is something to treat mildly, um, this situation is far from the bubonic plague 2.0, okay? Here's, here's the data that came in um, during the studies of this as it rippled through China. And we have to remember that even this data is coming from a population density far higher than ours and what rapidly became heavily overwhelmed medical facilities. And so this is the worst possible scenario version of the data. And we can expect that if anything, our experiences are going to be better than what this data portrays. Okay, what do we learn? First thing we learn is this. The majority of the infections of this are mild. As you can see here, 80% plus of people don't have to be hospitalized, don't have to do anything other than stay at home, rest, sleep, try and eat well, and let your body fight the disease off. There's a percentage that uh, would do well to get some uh, additional medical care, but that percentage is not 50%. The percentage is not 75%. Um, it is uh, in the 20% um, range or so. Of the people who get the disease, the overwhelming majority of them recover. Here's a graph that talks about the uh, percentage currently ill. Uh, again, this is from a little while back in China, but currently ill, recovered, and those who have died. We can see of the you know, 90 some percent of people that have wrestled with this illness so far, the, um, the percentage of people who have not recovered is in the 3.5%. And actually there's good reason to suspect it's far lower than that, which we'll talk about. Um, but this is not a, a situation where if you catch the coronavirus, there is a good chance that that's the end for you. That is far from the case here. In fact, um, it is something that is not overly contagious or overly deadly. This is kind of a complicated um, chart here, but uh, what, um, what epidemiologists and so forth do is they'll chart diseases uh, contagiousness, how rapidly they spread, and a disease's threat, what, uh, what likelihood there is of recovery. And they're still pinning down what's happening here, but you can see the, um, the effect of this virus is in the lower left-hand corner, which means this, it is not overly deadly and it is not overly contagious. And in fact, if you can look at that, it's, it's kind of small, I know, but if you look at it, the window that this thing lives in somewhere, which is still being pinned down, it's roughly as contagious as a common cold, and it's roughly as dangerous as measles. And that's in the instance of a broken uh, medical system. And so this is not the kind of, holy cow, we need to all panic, we're all going to die, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? That is not this situation. Now, that doesn't mean this is something that we treat lightly, and there are some important things that we do need to know about this. But the first thing I want to say is this. Let's be purposeful. Let's be intentional. Let's not panic. This is not a panic moment for the overwhelming majority of us. Now, the risk is higher for some segments of the population. 
Uh, those over 60 are at a much higher risk of uh, not recovering uh, from this illness. And so this is the, um, the uh, mortality rate broken down by age group. And you can see that if you're um, 50 or above, there's a, there's a much higher chance that you have to, to deal with something. Um, but if you're lower than that, the odds are very low that this is going to be highly problematic for you. On top of that, it's not just age. This thing is also highly correlated uh, with pre-existing conditions. And so you can see here, we have people who have um, cardiovascular disease or diabetes, chronic respiratory disease. This is kind of a respiratory illness. Um, the, the, um, the mortality rate is far higher in these situations, and it is very low in the case of no existing condition. So what does all of this say? Here's, here's how I understand all of this, interpret all of this as, as a scientist, is that this is something where if you have to already watch your health, you should watch your health with this. This is also something where if you already don't have to worry a whole lot about your health, you probably don't have to worry a whole lot about your personal safety. The threat here is to people who already need to be proactive about our health. And so we're going to exercise wisdom and prudence, but we are not going to panic. Now, um, this is um, a situation where if you are in that higher risk segment of the population, please act with great wisdom. I'm, I'm not suggesting that we are in denial of these facts. I'm trying to actually clarify them so we understand uh, what we need to do. Please be uh, intentional in advance to take care of yourself. Do things like get good sleep at night, make sure you're eating well, take vitamin supplements, and of course, everyone should be doing what they can to be washing their hands, avoiding contact with their mouth and eyes, um, you know, not coughing into our hand and shaking people's hands, things like that. We can take healthy precautions and we should do that, particularly if we are in that, uh, that segment of people that need to watch their health proactively. But the most important thing I think that all of us need to do is to be being purposeful to stay out of fear. The panic on top of this thing is for the overwhelming majority of us far more destructive than the disease itself will be. So, um, is this whole thing overblown then? <laughs> why, why, are, why is the University of Illinois pushing classes online? Why did we cancel our services? Like, are, is this all just being made up? <laughs> well, some of what's happening here is connected to the collective strategies for what you do when you have a new disease breaking out. <clears throat> the first strategy that happens that you put into place when a new disease shows up is called containment. And in containment, what you try and do is, it's a, it's a pretty simple idea, you just, you try and find out, okay, where does this disease live? And we're gonna just cut off any road for that disease to get out to other people. And if it's a disease where people will develop natural immunity and you can isolate it, then the problem will be solved. No one else will get sick. All those people will get their own natural immunity, problem dealt with. And so the first strategy that was put into place is containment. And that's why things like cities are being shut down. Why are cities being shut down? Is it because, you know, people are going to be dying in the streets everywhere? That is not why cities are being shut down. It's because it's a radical measure taken to create that containment. And so that's why China is shutting cities down and Italy is shutting cities down. Um, it's a difficult strategy um, to employ because there is a, a few day incubation period, somewhere between 2 and 14 for most of us, where you can have the disease but not have symptoms of it. You can be a carrier of it. And so the idea is shut it down early, try and cut the thing off at the head, um, and, um, and we can hopefully separate this thing. Now, there is a second strategy that you employ if the first one fails. And in our very highly connected 21st century, um, it turns out that that containment strategy has not been overly successful. Um, if you look, for example, at the uh, map of recent uh, cases of coronavirus in the states, here's what it looks like. You can see there are cases that are spread all throughout the country. And what that means is it's probably not possible to contain it. It's probably not possible to sort of cut it off and, and apply that strategy. And so what you do is you wind up switching strategies to something that's called mitigation. And in mitigation, what you do is you say, okay, 
the, the idea that we can cut this thing off at the source is probably a lost cause. This thing is going to propagate through our culture to, to some big extent. And I think that that is a good fact for us to um, accept. It's not an easy fact, but it is a good fact for us to accept. We are probably in the situation where the coronavirus is going to spread throughout even our community. There may likely be cases that haven't been recognized yet. But because the, there's so much fear around this whole thing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name this thing a different thing that I think is a little more uh, representative of the situation we find ourselves in. What we have going on is a corona cold, okay? We do not have a bubonic plague. This is not a corona plague. This is a corona cold here. It's a bad cold. It's a cold we should be wise with, but it is a cold. We have a second cold that is going to come through our community. That is the situation that we are in. And so what we want to do, the strategy we want to employ is, if we've got a, a cold season that is going to come through our community, how can we collectively as a community act in such a way that the people who need medical care can get the medical care they need, and our finite resources to do that are not overwhelmed too quickly. There's a, um, a chart that we're going to put up here which uh, describes the mitigation strategy, which is called flattening the curve. And you can see here, this, this, is, this is a chart that basically describes two things. The, the orange curve would be, here's the way that our, our, uh, the, the corona cold would spread throughout our community if we did nothing to slow it down. And the blue curve is, okay, if we're purposeful to slow it down, here's what it might look like. And you can see the orange curve happens much quicker and shoots up much higher. You have more people infected at the same time. The blue curve is longer, but it's much lower. And the reason that we care about those is that horizontal line represents our finite healthcare capacities. We do not have infinite people that work at the hospitals around here. We do not have an infinite number of hospital beds or IVs or all of the different things that need to be used. And so if too many people get this at once, then there can be unnecessary destruction that we can take care of if we can slow it down and keep everybody under the line. The orange curve is what happened in China. It overwhelmed the, the, the healthcare systems. And that is why in China even the, that mortality rate was much higher. In the places where they've been able to slow the curve down and keep it under good uh, medical uh, situations, the mortality rate has been significantly less, less than 1% even than uh, what was seen in China. And so the strategy here is called flattening the curve. And it is collectively acting for, uh, to sacrifice the things we need to sacrifice to try and protect the people who are at threat for this thing. And so this is why, for example, U of I is saying uh, we are going to go to online classes. Because when you have hundreds, when you have maybe thousands of students walking through the same building, swapping germs as one another, that is how these things spread very quickly. Um, this is why we have decided to be creative with our weekend gatherings here because there's not too many places in uh, Urbana and in Sullivan where you have about 2,000 or 500 people gathering once a week collectively interchanging germs with one another. There's just not too many places that happens. And so we are a place where we actually present kind of a, of a threat for this losing uh, a level of containment in our community. Does this mean we're, um, we are laying down our weekend services all coming together um, out of fear? No, that is not at all what's happening. This is not a fear move. Like I said, there is a corona cold happening. This is not a response out of fear. What this is, is this is a choice for us as a community to make a sacrifice to serve the cities that we are a part of. I might put it this way, uh, quoting uh, Jesus a little bit differently. Greater love has no church than this, that a church lays down its weekend service for its community. That is what's happening here. We are saying, you know what? We can be creative. We can gather in different ways. We can use the wonderful technology we have to help all the people in our community who might be at risk for this thing. That is what we're doing here. So with all of that, let's turn to 
Where do we go forward from here? What does it mean to have a response of faith in this unstable time? Okay, two things. I want to talk about us individually. I want to talk about us collectively. Individually, I want to suggest what we need to do is to walk forward in wisdom plus faith. Okay? The reason we took all of that stuff in the beginning, we dove into all of that, is it's important for us to understand the situation and to re- respond in wisdom. If, if we are at, in an at-risk situation, let's take natural precautions that make sense. There's no reason not to do that. It's, it's easy. We can do it. But we also want to respond in faith. There is a load of fear and panic and terror that is stacked on top of this situation. There is. There is um, like, oh my goodness, I don't understand what's happening. Ah, I got to do something. And, 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 and it is a real situation we need to take seriously, but we do not need to choose the panic and the fear and the terror. We can say no to fear and we can say yes to faith. Why can we do that? Because Jesus is just as much king as he has ever been. That has not in any way changed. And we, as the community of faith, approach us from a different place. You know, much of the world is in denial, but what they believe is that they're in control of their own lives. And so when something like this that's out of control comes up, the response is panic. Oh no, I don't know what to do. Ah, this is terrifying. That's actually not the situation we find ourselves in. When we follow Jesus, we yield our lives to Jesus. Our life has never been in our control since we followed him. Our life has always been under Jesus' leadership and under Jesus' lordship. And so for us, nothing has changed. Jesus is still king. He's still bigger than the coronavirus. We do not need to live in fear. We can trust him. We can say no to fear and yes to faith. Now, one quick point I want to make here. I want to encourage us to be intentional with our interaction with the media. A lot of the fear about this has happened because there has been a media stream that we cannot escape from. Here's a a chart that mentions, uh, that captures the mentions in the media of um, COVID-19, that's uh, coronavirus in the orange. And in the blue, we have SARS and HIV and Ebola and all the other diseases added together. What do I see here? I see an overwhelming media stream in our face. Now, I'm not trying to say that that is purposefully an attack on us. I don't think that's the case. A lot of the media is trying to get the word out so we can take the right choices early and we can protect the right people. But if we are getting constantly saturated in this and we don't understand it, it is so easy to get caught in this this trap of fear and panic. And what I felt I heard Jesus say is I felt I heard him give us this challenge. Have we talked with Jesus about the coronavirus as much as we've talked with the media? Have we talked with Jesus about this situation as much as we've talked with the media? And I mean literally, what if we just did that? What if we set a literal timer and we said, I'm going to talk to Jesus about this more than I'm going to talk to the media? Not I'm going to ignore the media, but I'm going to make sure Jesus is the first perspective in my mind, not the, the one after the media. As we do that, that will break the power of fear in this situation. Now, to, um, to minister to this briefly, I, I felt the Lord say that it was important for us um, to read a few psalms. And so what I want to do, um, it just briefly here, is I want to read some psalms about the ways that Jesus promises he will protect us when we trust, when we believe, when we look to him, when we're under his lordship. And so here's what I want you to do. Wherever you are right now, I just, I want you to get comfortable. I want you to relax Close your eyes, put your hands out, take a deep breath, just kind of release whatever stress or tension, and let's let the the Lord and the word of the Lord minister to us. This is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. 
You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Guys, that, that is our promise. Even in the middle of the, sh- uh, the valley of the shadow of death, even in the presence of our enemies, the Lord is with us and his protection has not left us. I'm gonna read a segment of Psalm 91. I wanna encourage you, read this this week. Maybe even when, when our service here is done, just take the time, read it out loud wherever you're at. Here's, here's a few uh, verses out of Psalm 91, starting in verse three. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. The most high who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. I bless each and every one of us right now with the presence and the protection and the peace of the Lord. God, I ask you would break the power of fear over our community, Lord, that you would cover us with your presence, that you would protect us from every pestilence, from every plague, and that, Lord, you would establish us as a stabilizing force in our community that is caught up in this fear and panic. And so I break the power of that fear and panic off of us in Jesus' name, and I release you to be at peace and to release the peace of the Lord. Communally, we need to remember, we walk forward with honor and with flexibility, carrying the power of God. We can live in peace and we can extend that peace. I mean, what a great time to be the vineyard, to believe in prayer for healing. Like this is, this is sort of the, the best possible opportunity we can have. There are so many people who need peace, who need, uh, who will need healing, who need, um, you know, freedom from the fear and the panic. This is, if anything, guys, this is our moment This isn't a time to panic. This isn't a a time to go on the defense. This is our moment. Let's step into this thing. We have an interesting time ahead of us. I don't think that the interruption that this is going to cause society is going to be over in the next week or two. I wish that it was, and I pray that I'm wrong. (laughs) But if I understand the situation, and if the way this thing is playing out in the rest of the world is anything like the way it'll play out here in our, in our communities. We have an interruption ahead of us that's gonna continue for a little while. <laughs> and I want to say a couple of things about that that are important. We have to continue to take the situation as it comes. I'm not saying anything concrete. I'm not, I'm not saying what will or won't happen. I don't know the future, but I wanna set some realistic expectations. The first thing I think is important for us as a community to do is to do this. Let's all choose right now, right now, in this moment, we are not going to let the enemy use this to isolate us from our church family. That's, what, that's part of the strategy of the enemy here is to make everyone else seem like a threat, seem dangerous. So I'm going to go hide by myself and I'm going to cut myself off from the rest of society. Now, for a segment of people, that might be wisdom. So I'm not trying to, if, it, if you are in that segment, do that. But for many of us, we do not need to have that fear and we do not need to have that isolation. And while we cannot gather as a collective body for right now on our weekends, there is no reason that we cannot gather with the body of Christ. In fact, I would suggest why not just gather with your small group or gather with a group of friends on the weekends, collectively listen to the message and take some time and pray for one another and worship together. Guys, we can still be the body of Christ. We can't meet all in one room, but that is not a problem. We can meet in hundreds of rooms and we can still fellowship together. The enemy can scatter us 
but he can't stop us unless we choose to disengage. And the threat here is not just that we disengage from faith. Oh, whatever, no church to go to, whatever. It's not that. It's that we disengage from community. It's that we disengage from fellowship. That's his strategy. In the midst of this situation, the other thing is this. We need to be aware of how this is all going to affect the community we live in. There are going to be a lot of needs that we can step into and help people meet. There's going to be a lot of physical needs. There's going to be people who have illnesses that might need prayer, or they might need someone to say, I'll go pick up toilet paper for you. Or it might be you ran out of toilet paper because there have been panicked runs at the grocery store, and I happen to have some extra. Let me give some to you. There's going to be physical needs to meet. There's going to be emotional needs to meet. There is a lot of fear and panic. We know that. We can be the stabilizing force. There's going to be economic needs. As, um, you know, schooling is getting disrupted. Industry after industry is going to get disrupted, and not everyone is in a situation where that is going to be equally weatherable. (laughs) There are economic needs. Let's be generous. This is the moment where we can share what we have and trust that God will provide for us. And there is going to be a lot of social needs. If this thing goes on, let's imagine, I don't know what's going to happen, but let's just imagine that this, the current situation lasts for, say, three months, right? Where all the social gatherings, big social gatherings are canceled, right? All the NBA games, all the whatever, all of it is canceled. We are going to have a whole lot of very lonely people in our community, We're going to have a whole lot of people that are looking for friendship. They are looking for family. They are looking for community. And you know what? I can't imagine a better situation that we can say, hey, you know what? You look like you're feeling lonely and you look like you're afraid right now. And I can recognize that because I'm not. I am neither lonely nor afraid. And I want to invite you. Hey, there's this thing that I do with some friends of mine on the weekend where we get together. It's not too many of us. It's like 10 of us, so you don't have to worry about catching something. But why don't you come and listen to a message of hope? And why don't you come and experience some community? You know, we have been a multi-site church for like 11 years at this point. And the way I'm processing this is we are going from one site to two sites, which is what we did 11 years ago, to hundreds of sites. We are now have hundreds of sites spread throughout our communities. The infection that's happening here is not just the infection of COVID-19 in our community. It's the infection of our church outside the walls to the community. (laughs) That's the one that we can focus on. God is infecting our counties with our presence in a new way. He's putting us in a place where it's so easy to reach out and connect. In the book of Acts... Jesus says, disciples go to the whole world. And you know what they do? For five years, they stay in Jerusalem and they don't leave until persecution arises. And when persecution arises, they scatter. And not too long after that, you have churches around the whole world. I know the enemy is working to make us worried about, oh no, coronavirus is going to affect our community. Realistically, there will likely be a corona cold. That's true. (laughs) But I think the true infection that's happening is an infection of hope, an infection that scatters us where we truly have the opportunity to love our community. That thing we've been talking about, we are now positioned in our community in a way we never have been before. Guys, this is our moment. And following Jesus, we can take it. Thanks for listening to the message today. To experience more powerful messages, go to vineyardlive.us or Join our Vineyard Life Plus community to view conferences, trainings, and special teachings.